as well as uh, uh, tailors and seamstresses from around the state to work making uniforms for these troops about face -off. On his back, he has a early war hard pack knapsack. The soldiers would carry all of their goods in that backpack, uh, whatever they had, extra clothing, uh, Bibles, literature, things like that, uh, toiletry items. He also has his cookware on here, you can see, and he has a blanket rolled across the top there. Now, a lot of soldiers didn't like these knapsacks much, and later they discarded those uh, in favor of the blanket roll down there on the end, which we'll talk about in a second. The other gear that this soldier has on, which you can see, which the rest of these men have, is the things that he needs for fighting. As you see this man here, he is ready to go on campaign. Like infantrymen, even today, who go out on patrols, he's carrying everything that he needs to fight and survive on his body there. His cartridge box will be full of the best This carries his cartridges for his gun, which would include a paper tube with gunpowder and a lead mini ball, which is what these infields fired. Mini ball was invented by a French inventor named Claude Vignet, and it was a step up from the solid lead ball. Uh, it was much more accurate. It engaged the rifling and had a, a conical shape, and that allowed a soldier uh, to fire more accurately with more velocity behind the ball at much longer ranges than a round ball. He would take that cartridge and go through a process of loading called loading in nine times, which was the basic training version of learning how to do that. On the battlefield, an infantry soldier would be expected to meet the standard of three shots per minute. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you take and do a little math, an infantry company on paper was 100 men. A regiment was 10 companies. So within one minute of each man firing three rounds, that's a lot of lead going down range towards the enemy. Once they had gotten close enough, they'd inflicted enough damage, fix the bayonet. They would put the bayonet on the end of their musket. Guard. Punch. They would close with, bayonet the enemy, and move them off the battlefield. Recover. Shoulder. Arms. Now, the bayonet was as much as a psychological weapon as anything, and it was used at the Battle of Prairie Grove. Men came into close combat and used the bayonet with on each other. Here at this battle, uh, there wasn't a lot of bayonet use, but swords and things like that were used at close quarters for a few minutes. Uh, step back. These next two soldiers here, you can see, are uniform. Step forward. These soldiers are uniformed in a later war uniform because of the shortage of material in the South. The frock coat was shortened into something called a shell jacket, which you see these gentlemen here wearing. Now, gray was generally the chosen color for Confederate uniforms, but as you can see here, there were different shades of gray depending on the dyes available and where they were made. Most of these men are very well equipped. They're both also carrying infield rifle muskets, as you see here, port arms. soldiers had something that's pretty unique to Arkansas soldiers. Who so here's heard of an Arkansas toothpick? So here's one right here. Arkansas troops were famed for their use of Bowie knives. Arkansas toothpick at the time was a term that wasn't specific to this exact design of knife that came later. It referred to any long belt knife carried by Arkansans. Uh, in lieu of a bayonet at close quarters, a lot of these soldiers would pull these uh, knives out and put them into use. Now, as time went on, uh, like infantrymen even today, the more gear that an infantryman has to carry around for a long time, the more they would discard things that they didn't use so much. So a lot of those things literally got thrown out on the side of the road uh, after a couple 30 or 40 mile marches, as you can imagine. 
These two men down here on the end, step forward, are equipped and dressed much more like soldiers in the early part of the war, or even the very late stages of the war would have appeared. Also, like a lot of the Arkansas Confederates here at the Battle of Fayetteville would have appeared. Irregular in uniform and dress, irregular in arms and accoutrements also. These men were fighting with antiquated smooth bore muskets, shotguns, and pistols, which weren't good for any ranges much more than 100 yards, 150 yards or so. These men are both carrying smooth bore 1842 muskets, which were a 69 caliber smooth bore gun. It was not rifled like the infield. It was not as accurate. They could accept a bayonet, uh, but a lot of times they were issued without the bayonet. These were carried by American soldiers during the Mexican-American War also, and they were in a lot of state arsenals and federal arsenals at the onset of the war. Some Arkansas troops even carried the obsolete flintlock muskets, which were very similar to the type used in the Revolutionary War. And when we get done talking, we have a wide array of weapons carried by Arkansas troops over here on this table. You're welcome to come over and have a look at that gear and even handle some of those. We even have some original weapons there. These men, like I said, are wearing irregular uniforms, basically the clothing that they would be wearing in their daily lives. Uh, the Conscription Act was passed in Arkansas in 1862, which was just like the draft. And so a lot of Arkansasers who had not volunteered were pressed into service. A lot of those men would just go to war with whatever they had. If they had not been issued a weapon, they would bring their personal weapons from home, like double barreled shotguns and squirrel rifles, Pennsylvania rifles, and even military surplus and things like that. Now this soldier over here in the beautiful green coat, not a leprechaun, uh, he has something called a blanket roll on. We were talking about the knapsack earlier, like you see Sergeant Beck wearing. Those were often discarded because those straps that you see across his chest tended to pull down on the trap muscles of a soldier, especially the more weight they have on there and they were pretty uncomfortable. So a lot of soldiers, on both sides of the conflict, not just Confederates, Federals also would wear something like this called a blanket roll. Order on. A blanket roll was literally made of the soldier's blanket, which was laid out on the ground, and then their extra clothing and personal items would be laid on that. They would have one of their buddies help them twist it up. They would turn it around, and they would attach it by a piece of rope or leather back here behind them. Now, he also, like Sergeant Beck, is fully equipped to go into battle with everything he has. Private Warford here, he doesn't have a blanket roll, so before battle, sometimes these soldiers would take off their heavy knapsacks or blanket rolls to make themselves a little bit lighter and leave them behind. One of the problems with that is, as the pace of battle advances, you might not come back to where you were. You might not have the chance to recover those personal items, and so then you would be without. So after a while, a lot of experienced infantry soldiers would go ahead and they would wear all of their gear into battle. Private Warford also has a large D-guard Bowie knife. This is another version of the Arkansas toothpick that was very common. And this one right here is actually a reproduction of one carried at the Battle of Pea Ridge by an Arkansas soldier in the 17th Arkansas. It was recovered from the Lee Town battlefield after the battle, and this is an accurate reproduction of that knife. Now, whether a conscript or a volunteer, these men would be trained as well as they could with what little time they had. A lot of times, these men had no time to be trained, and they were pushed directly into battle, which, of course, could be a problem. You imagine uh, not really knowing how to fight, not knowing how to follow orders, not knowing how to uh, move in very tight formation like you see here. That can cause a lot of problems. And in battles like Pea Ridge and Prairie Grove, it did with untrained troops. Other times, when a sergeant like Sergeant Beck here had time to train the troops very well, they were very well drilled, very proficient in their methods. Firing these muskets is a task. Like I said, these are muzzle loaders. They were expected to fire about three rounds a minute, and they would load that through a process in training called load in nine times. Detail, let's see. Load. First step is to bring the musket around to the foot outside there. Because they are in formation, you see they have to keep 
keep that in their very small working area. If they're flailing around and stuff, they're going to hit their buddies and their buddies going to stab them with their Arkansas teeth tape. So what they're doing is they pull a cartridge out. They take the cartridge out of their cartridge box, they rip the top with their teeth, they pour that powder down the barrel, and then they push the ball in with their finger. At that point, the weapon is hot. It has a live charge in it, so they have to take care especially after they've been firing, not to put their hand over the muzzle. Because if that goes off, they lose their hand with it. So you'll see the attention paid to the safety here when they return those ramrods back to their holders. Once the musket is loaded and rammed, the last step is to prime that with a small cap of fulminate mercury. That would be placed on the cone on the back of the rifle or musket. And once that was in place, the soldiers would return to the position of shoulder arms so that the officer in charge of that company can look down the ranks and when he sees everybody ready, he can then give the command. At this time, folks, we are going to fire, so Robert, would you keep people there and let's not let anybody pass through there, so. All right, if you want to hold your ears, just go ahead and we're going to fire our call. Detail, ready! semblance in the ranks there. Now the infantry was the prime mover on the battlefield, but without cavalry support and without artillery support, the infantry was very vulnerable to both of those as well as to attacks by other infantry. The infantry was by far the largest branch on both sides of the war and still is the largest in the military today. Confederate infantry from Arkansas served on both sides here at the Battle of Fayetteville, the 1st Arkansas Infantry, which had not yet received their pretty blue uniforms from the federal government, were dressed much like the Confederates here in their civilian clothing. So Colonel Harrison, in his wisdom, decided that to help cut down on friendly fire accidents, he would send them a couple of hundred yards to the rear in a reserve and support position to keep them out of the fray and keep them from causing any confusion on the battlefield. The last Confederate infantry from Arkansas surrendered 
Months after General Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia in April of 65, in June and July of 65, Arkansas were still making their way up from Texas and surrendering at Fort Smith and places like that. What was left of the 34th Arkansas, including Company B, which by this point was about 33 men, came up here and they surrendered at Fort Smith and then made their way back home to a ravaged Northwest Arkansas. Thank you for your time. We do have a display over here. If you'd like to come over and check this out, you can check out some of the weapons. We appreciate you all being here. And again, please do remember that although this is fun and we're learning, we are on ground that was consecrated by blood of men from both sides of this conflict. That should be remembered, and we should do our best never to let that happen in this country again. Thank you very much. We appreciate you.